Welcome everyone um, to the 23rd Jewish Film Festival, um, a program of the Jewish Federation, the JCRC. We're really glad um, you all are here with us this afternoon and took time out of um, your day and your afternoon to be here for this really important program with some very important guests from across the country um, for this very important film. I, I hope everybody saw it. I watched it on Saturday and um, as I was talking with on, we got on a few minutes before. Um, it was not something I was ready for, um, and it you know it uh, it was far more powerful than um, I I had thought it would be. So um, just a few housekeeping things. This program is being recorded and will be available on our website. And today we will be discussing a Tree of Life, a documentary about the horrific shootings um, at the Pittsburgh synagogue and its impact on the congregation and, uh, you know, what it's done to our Jewish community since and what it's done to transform that. The film is being streamed on our website until midnight tonight. In case you haven't yet seen it, I would strongly recommend you do so. And once you click on the film, you have 48 hours to finish watching it. Um, it's now my honor and my pleasure to introduce you to our panel today. Again, we thank these individuals for making the time to be here. Um, we have, um, we have Trish Adlisic, the filmmaker and moderator of today's discussion. Trish, thank you. This is, you know, I'm sure you are in demand and um, we are greatly appreciative of your time and willingness to be here with our community. We have Brad Orsini, Senior National Security Advisor for the Secure Community Network, a program of the Jewish Federations of North America. Brad, thank you for all you do to help keep our community safe. I've had the um, pleasure to um, interact with you on numerous calls throughout this pandemic and um, thank you for your service and doing all you do. Um, I don't know, is Audrey here or was she unable to come? She's unable, we have Barry okay. Berber who's here. Okay, so I'm gonna to get to Barry. So um, we also have Susan uh, Margolin, the film producer. Susan, thank you so much for taking the um, opportunity to be here with us today. My we have Barry Werber, a survivor of the shooting. Barry, thank you so much. We are so grateful you are um, not only here, but here um, and you know able to share your story with us. And again, my name is Willie Recht, and um, thank you for joining us today. And I want to turn it over to Trish before we uh, get into this. Thank you very much um, for the lovely introduction and for hosting the film so we can have this important and meaningful conversation. I'd like to first just take a moment of silence and read the names of those that were so tragically taken. We must never forget. Um, and, you know, the film was really made in honor of them. Sorry to Sometimes it is me too. Um, Joyce Feinberg, Cecil Rosenthal, David Rosenthal, Irving Younger, Mel Wax, Richard Gottfried, Rose Mellinger, Jerry Rabinowitz, Daniel Stein, Bernice Simon, Sylvan Simon. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. So, and I, uh, no, no, be please. I was just um, um, going to, um, you know, I'm so thankful to be here to have this important conversation and um, just want to acknowledge the team again, Susan, for being an extraordinary producer. Uh, these films are very difficult to make because, you know, there's so much at stake in how we present the stories. And, you know, the film was really made to. Um, honor those that were so tragically taken, but also to address the rising tide of anti-Semitism in America and hate in all forms. And um, it was, um, you know, really in my heart, in our hearts, that we did a Greek choral approach and that uh, people had agency, the participants had agency over how their story was told and what they wanted to say. And I think it's also very important to note that there were three congregations in the building um, Barry is from the New Light Congregation, um, and um, also Dor Hadash and Tree of Life. So there were three, and it's very important to the participant that that be, that be identified um, because of the building being called of Tree of Life. So I, I just wanted to acknowledge that, and then um, we can begin in, to answer any questions or have this important discussion.
Um, also, one other thing that is very important for us is, you know, having Brad Orsini, you know, there's 3,726 synagogues in America and um, obviously more religious buildings, but, you know, Brad is pivotal in, in ensuring that every single one of them have training, you know, that we want to use the film as a beginning step to just make sure everybody's getting the training um, because, you know, a number of the survivors had the training and I'll let Brad speak to this, but um, Secure Community Network is, you know, as you know, readily available to support and activate trainings all over the US and even Canada and other parts of the world. So I'll let Brad speak to that, but he's been doing an extraordinary job in ensuring this takes place. Can I ask just a quick question about the three congregations? Yes. I was a little confused. So are is each of them meeting on a different floor? Is that how it worked? Yes. Can I oh. answer that? Yes, Barry, go ahead. Uh, we were meeting in the basement. Uh, it originally was a chapel that Three of Life no longer used. And it was converted to our needs as we were, lit, were having services in a combination house and synagogue and the building itself was falling apart and we didn't have the uh, funds to uh, take care of it. And we were lucky enough to find an organization and one of the Orthodox organizations that wanted more space and wanted to buy our building. And using the funds from that buyout, we were able to rent the basement area, the chapel area at the Tree of Life Dor Hadash was meeting in, I believe, the ballroom at the Tree of Life. And uh, of course, Tree of Life was meeting in their own uh, synagogue area. But I have to constantly remind people that there were three congregations. There were three congregations that were hurt by this terrible tragedy. And um, not to confuse the situation when they say Tree of Life, to know that there were definitely three congregations. Thank you. Thanks. I think one of the, and I don't know, this is more of a statement, but um, one, of the, what, one of the things I learned when watching the film was that just, but for the grace of God, you know, there's one Shabbat a month where the children um, weren't there. Um, and that just, I don't know, just hit me. Um, you know, not that, it was terrible what happened, but just by sheer grace that those kids weren't there that day too. I don't, again, it's more of a statement and a feeling than a, a question, but. I can add to that also the fact that it happened as early as it did. Uh, our services didn't start till a quarter to 10. However, uh, as, as many people know, Jewish services will start at a quarter to 10, 10 o'clock, maybe 10, 15, but be there by 1030. And that's exactly what happened. A lot of the people were coming into the synagogue at 1030 or 10 o'clock after the gunman had already entered. If he had been there later than when he arrived, uh, there would have been a lot more of a uh, Holocaust. Um, I don't... I don't want to, if, if there's other people that have questions and I don't want to take up the time, but I, I feel like one of the things that was so important and maybe other folks have told you this for me personally, I mean, I remember that day very, very clearly. It was one of the few days we've actually worked on Shabbat and we met with the rabbis in my office. Um, you know, we planned a 1700 person, uh, memorial service two days later, but what I didn't realize until I watched this on Saturday was that I never processed this. I cried on Saturday when I watched the movie because you just get into mode. You know, I wasn't there. We were 3000 miles away, but there are certain things you do, unfortunately, when these things happen. And my husband's even told me after Coryville too, he's like, Willie, you don't even think about what happens. Sometimes you just, you know, you just, you call the FBI and you email the presidents and you send an email to the rabbis and you know, you, there's just these things. And so it was almost cathartic in a very sad way. Um, you know, to watch this film and, and have those feelings um, and have that emotional experience to what happened. And for that, I'm grateful, you know, for that experience. Yeah, thank you, Willie. It is, it's, it's definitely, um, 
traumatic, but you know, remembering it is so important and doing something about it to, to fight back and stop it and to honor those, you know, um, is something we really wanted to shed light on. And I think going back to Brad Orsini, um, so he can come into the conversation about, you know, the security efforts and what we need to be doing and looking at and thinking about. Um, and, you know, I see there's a question in the chat that will, I'd like to, you know, have Brad given this opportunity to talk about his work. Thanks, Trish. And it, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. And Barry, it's, it's good to see your face, sir. Uh, I'm glad to see you. Uh, glad to be seen. Just, just to kind of contextualize what I do, uh, I spent a little over 32 years in federal government service. And then I retired in January of 2017 and I became Pittsburgh's first communal security director. And what was really important for us in Pittsburgh was that awareness and the awareness to provide people with the tools to live. Uh, we can't pick and choose the time of these incidents and we can't stop all incidents, but we can hopefully train our community to mitigate loss of life. And when I first started this communal security role and I spent 28 and a half years in the FBI and I worked civil rights and I worked hate crimes and I've seen during my FBI time how the Jewish community was impacted. And it was great to join the community and, and work with the community. But what was really important early on in 2017, the community wasn't reporting. The community was tolerating, unfortunately, anti-Semitism. And we weren't reporting as much as we should have. And that's not going to negate by any stretch of the imagination what happened at Shreya Life. And I, I, that what happened happened there. But what was important early on in 2017 is we, we educate our community on what to do in one of these incidents. And I worked as a crisis manager for the Bureau for many years and unfortunately have gone to way too many crime scenes, responded to way too many active shooter scenes. And our goal in the Jewish community in Pittsburgh was really to train as many people as we could. And so prior to the attack on Tree of Life, we trained a little over 6,000 folks in the Jewish community at 135 separate training sessions. So within a year and a half, we went out 135 separate times doing countering active threats, stop the bleed, situational awareness, usher greeter training, just preparing our community. And, and what happened on the 27th, you know, we all know, and, and for me, at about 11 o'clock, 10.30, 11 o'clock on that Saturday evening when we we're still working and I'm going back to the Jewish Community Center where we actually had our command post and our Victim Reco Reconciliation Center, I saw one of the, the survivors of Tree of Life there and Steve Weiss was in the movie and, and Steve was one of those individuals that we trained and that a lot of the folks had been trained. And Steve and his wife and his family was there, came up to me and said, Brad, actually his wife, Steve lived, he followed the training and he lived. And, and I don't know why I said this on that evening, but I said, Steve, I, I, I hope one day you're willing to repeat that story because today is such a horrific day. And, and through this horrific day, something good has to happen. So if something good is training other people across the country so they can be safe, that's what we got to take away from what happened in Tree of Life. And as a security-minded individual, that's what I take. And that's why I'm still working. And, and, and just every day, I just got into my hotel room in Massachusetts, and I'm doing a large-scale law enforcement presentation for law enforcement tomorrow. Then I'm meeting with the federations in Massachusetts this week to train them just to do the same thing we did in Pittsburgh. So I can see more berries on the screen when something bad happens and, and Barry saved his own life and, and so many others that day. And it's so important that our community gets this training reports, every sign of hate. Uh, I, I think we've, we, we have requests from all over the country to do this training this Thursday, we're actually doing a national webinar on Stop the Bleed at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Anybody on this call can sign up for any one of our trainings. Sign up for these trainings. Go and get them. Uh, we need to build a resilient community because unfortunately what's going on now in our community is 
we're being targeted on a daily basis. So we've seen Pittsburgh, Poway, Jersey City, uh, Muncie, New York, Colleville. And those are the ones you hear about. What you don't hear about are all the threats that are being mitigated every day because people are aware and pushing that information up. So I encourage everybody, you know, report that, report those incidents, report them to law enforcement, report them to us at Secure Community Network. And we're here. We're here as your facilitator to help guide you and provide you those security resources. And Trish, that was probably a long winded answer, but I, I just wanted to get a few of those items out because I think it's so important for our community to be trained and to know what to do. And Brad, you're welcome to put a link to sign up for that training in the chat if you wish. Okay. If you have one. Anybody can go on securecommunitynetwork.org, go right onto our website, I encourage you for a couple of things. One, sign up for the training. Two, sign up for our daily newsletter that comes out at 8 a.m. Eastern every day. You can see what's going on. And that'll also direct you to when we have trainings, you'll be in that fold that you'll get notifications. Great. Thank you, Brad. I wanted to um, turn it over to Susan uh, to talk about... Um, you know, her experience in working on the film and what she sees as the, the hopeful poetry in the film and, you know, what we should all be thinking about. And, you know, when, you know, we share a life, share a lens into the lives of others, you know, everyone has a different experience in terms of our, you know, understanding and education around this. And I wanted, you know, Susan being the producer to hear her thoughts about where we can take, what our takeaways are around hope and what we can be doing. Thank you so much, Trish. Um, you know, I I do um, I do draw so much inspiration from the survivors, um, and uh, you know their messages and their philosophies of life are just so inspiring. Um, you know, I, my, my experience in, uh, you know, being a part of this film team is, you know, it's just been extraordinary. And I feel so fortunate to have met and um, gotten to know uh, many of the survivors over the past couple of years. Um, but I think that, you know, for me, um, the message of, you know, the communities coming together is, is the most hopeful um, and uh, inspiring. And, you know, the, the way that, first of all, uh, the Jewish community bonded together, but, um, you know, that, that the entire city of Pittsburgh uh, just came together without a moment's thought. Um, just, you know, we are there, we are there for the Jewish community. Um, it was something really spectacular in, in my mind. I'm not from Pittsburgh, um, but the way that uh, it felt like um, the, the community bonded in the most um, gorgeous way uh, and, you know, it, and came um, to the aid of the Jewish community saying, we are here, we will help to heal you. Um, and I, um, you know, am every, every time I think about this, I really um, am, am so, you know, kind of brought, it's very emotional for me, um, also thinking about uh, Wasi Muhammad and the way that the uh, Muslim community came forward and, you know, without a second thought said, you know, we, we are here and we're going to take care of every funeral um, without, you know, anybody having to think about a, a you know, a question of cost. And, uh, you know, in this, in, in these times, which, you know, we, we 
we experience often as so divisive. Um, to see that that happen gives me hope. And, and I hope that um, other people in, you know, uh, in audiences watching this film in Sacramento um, and in Berlin and, you know, um, it, around the world will be inspired by the way the communities have come together and said, you know, we, we will stand with the Jewish community and we are, we are one. Beautiful, Susan. That's incredible. It's very true. And Barry, you can speak to that directly because you, you've experienced this now since, the, you know, the day what, of the attack. About what was interesting to me was the effect that the situation have, had not only on the Jewish community in Pittsburgh, not only on, on the Jewish communities in other areas, but on the whole nation. Um, as a, a small sample, uh, we had a visit from a, a woman who was involved in a shooting in South Carolina. Uh, she told the most horrific story of the gunman actually coming up to her, putting the gun to her head, and saying, I'm not gonna pull the trigger. I'm not gonna kill you. I want you to tell the story. Um, and it turns out that our synagogue, she came to visit us, she told us the story, and it was the first time in two years that she had been able to talk about it. And it brought such a, a well up in myself and in some of the other survivors and, and the family members that were at that meeting that we all had to, had to go over and hug her. Um, but it did me a lot of good in knowing that maybe my experience can help someone else in some way. Uh, we have formed a group called Families Bridging Kindness. And we have made it a point to, at, at, at some of the anniversaries of some of the other uh, tragedies that have happened around the country, not only Jewish, but all types, of making these people aware that we are here, uh, we acknowledge their pain, but we are here to help them in any way we can. And uh, as a small memento, some, sometimes we send them a candle. And uh, we have formed some very nice uh, communications with some of these groups. Uh, on a side night, if I may say, I also received a personal letter. This letter came from a young lady that I had met in Georgia when I was stationed in the service. And uh, we had had a, uh, a, a meeting of the minds and, and we had dated for a while. And then I left Georgia and, and you have to remember this was in the sixties. And I came home, we communicate, communicated for a while. And then as time went by and as more family members took over, Mem memories and, and more family uh, needs took over, we kind of lost touch. But almost 60 years later, I get a, a letter from her, signed by her, her two sisters, and they were there for me. And I've kept on the communications with them since then. That's just a sample of some of the, the, the marvelous uh, connections we have made with other groups and, and other, uh, other families and other uh, nationalities all over the country, and in some cases all over the world. Uh, it's been a very uh, emotional trip, and uh, we've just gotten finished with uh, our commemoration uh, in October, where, um, and it was right after uh, uh, this terrible COVID, where we were able to get together at Chenley Park and meet with, with other members of, of different groups and the, the officers that, that saved us and that did so much for us. And it, it's, it's, been, it's been quite a, uh, quite a roller coaster in many ways. Thank you, Barry. I wanted to just mention that Barry was referring to the Emanuel Church shooting in South Carolina. And um, many of the um, 
people across America from Parkland have come to Pittsburgh. There's been a lot of connecting. Um, nobody wants to be a part of this club, but the love is, is so powerful and strengthening and, and building these bonds. It's like Michelle Rosenthal says in the films, you know, when one of these things is happening, you just know how it feels and you text each other. Um, and um, that's been really profound. And it's also, you know, seeing in the film Hannibal Lacumbe, he wrote the piece, um, you know, in response to what happened in, at Emmanuel. And, uh, you know, he was just about finished when Tree of Life attack happened. And so, as he said in the film, as you saw, he wanted to make a commentary. And that's how Audrey was invited to sound the shofar. So the intersectional approach of coming together, you know, that we can all support each other and help each other and fight back. And the, the, the power of the testimonials, you know, that people have an understanding and intervene uh, when they see hate, you know, brewing. And it's something we all have to take responsibility and being a part of fighting back on and holding our leadership accountable. Um, but I, I wanted to, I was just looking at some of the questions. Um, uh, the first one from Sharon is, um, I was wondering why some of the victims were featured so prominently in the film and others weren't mentioned. Um, so Sharon, the way in which um, we uh, told the story was with a trauma-informed approach. Um, my last film, um, I Am Evidence, I interviewed you know, 14 survivors of sexual assault and um, I saw trauma-informed training to work with survivors um, because many of them had complained about how they were treated by reporters and journalists, asking inappropriate questions, being insensitive. Even when I first started the film and I met Barry, you know, he told me how a man showed up his head his door like the day or a few days after with a box of donuts, banging on his home, home door after he'd been through this trauma and not knowing who it was and just, you know, the, the incredible level of rudeness that was taking place. So um, I grew up, you know, not far from Tree of Life and I was actually in Pittsburgh the day of the attack with my 91 year old father and um, this will answer uh, the first couple of questions. I was um, completely you know, in a state of shock, overwhelmed, horrified, terrified, you know, there were alerts, we didn't know if there were more shooters, how many there were, what was going on, and, um, you know, how do we choose to respond, what do we do, and being filmmakers, you know, our, our, our response is to make a film about it, is to tell the story, and we work on, on things that are deeply meaningful to us, and, you know, these films take three and a half years or more to make, and, um, and so um, the next day, you know, we went, went right to work. Um, a dear friend of mine, Elliot Joseph, who's one of the executive producers, um, he, um, both his parents survived Auschwitz and he sent a small grant to help hire local camera folks so we could begin the process. And then one thing led to another and um, that's how uh, it came about. But regarding those that aren't mentioned, so in the process of making the film, one interview leads to the next. So it's about relationships and it's really who's most comfortable to participate. It's not something we never wanna pressure anyone uh, to do or uh, they have to come to it themselves, you know, and really feel like they wanna share. And many of them did feel that way. And so that's how uh, those that are, the victims that are focused on are the ones uh, the family members who wanted to tell their stories and talk about their loved one. Um, for example, Anthony Feinberg, you know, I had, um, he lives in Paris and I remember talking with him very early one morning and he said he doesn't like documentaries, but he wants to be the one to tell his mother's story. And um, he felt very strongly about that. And so that's how uh, the voices came together to uh, be recognized in the film. And we make mention of everyone at the end in a dedication card, but uh, those that are featured are the ones that were most comfortable participating. And, and we really wanted to honor that participation and also acknowledge the others in the best way possible. So uh, that's how that came about. Um, and um, I think there's a question about um, if there's, are there are trainings scheduled? In yeah, the I, can, um, I can speak to that briefly. Yeah. Um, so we have been working, we reached out to SCN um, in January and knowing how busy they were. And there's, you know, as I said, there's 148 federations and thousands of synagogues who all want their services. So um, our community will have a community-wide training on March 30th. Um, it's actually going out 
um, very shortly. So everybody should get that um, information and uh, e-blast about that. And all congregations are welcome. We've spoken to many of the congregations already. And so we're grateful that SCN has uh, made time uh, to be coming to our community too. Great, that's great. Oh, thank you for that. Um, and I think, let's see. Um, yeah, so I, answered, you know, we made this, we started making the film right away, just within like 24 hours. Um, and that's how it all came about. Um, there, there, yes. there was a question regarding the training in Colville that the rabbi received and ju just the level set with everybody. They received the same exact training that we would have done uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, we followed our model from Pittsburgh and actually implemented it nationally and how we protect our, our, our shuls and, and our communal assets out there, we follow one blueprint. And now our goal really is to unify our security posture that if you're in a shul in Sacramento or you're in Pittsburgh, you're getting trained on run, hide, fight. You're getting trained on stop the bleed. You're getting distraction um, and control techniques on that fight back so you know what to do. And so that rabbi got that same training that we talked about for three years in Pittsburgh. And, and, and if I can, I just, I, I just want to uh, say one more thing. The third year anniversary of Tree of Life this past October really hit me because I was uh, back, I'm, I live in Pittsburgh, but I work nationally. So I'm, I'm usually traveling. And I was actually traveling during the third anniversary this year on October 27th. And somebody sent me a link to a local news report that was done. And it's from the local CBS affiliate in Pittsburgh. And they were interviewing one of the survivors, Audrey Glickman, who is, is prominently uh, portrayed in the, the film that you all saw today. And the reporter talked to Audrey about, you know, how she's feeling after three years. And Audrey's response she could have said whatever she wanted and Audrey's two minutes with this reporter was all about run hide fight and how run hide fight saved my life and I thought that really hit me and I took that link and I used it I think the next week in training especially for law enforcement because that's that's powerful for law enforcement to hear from people for, like Audrey or people like Barry that got out I'm a law enforcement official. I can say this to them, blue in the face to our entire community. But when they hear from people that survived this most horrific attack, and this is, make no mistake about it, this is our worst nightmare, where somebody comes in with a high power weapon, uh, whether there's security there or not, it didn't, it, honestly, folks, it didn't matter. He had an AR-15 with hundreds and thousands of rounds. He was getting in that building no matter what. And so understanding that, that resiliency from Audrey, that's what she could chose to take. And I called her up two days later and, and Barry, and I don't know if you have a thought about this, but I, I wanted to one, thank her because I saw the news clip and I told her I was going to use it when I was in Arizona uh, for a, a, a conference of about 500 law enforcement officials because I wanted to show it to her. And I asked her, Barry, how was she doing? She goes, Brad, you know me. I'm good. I was there that day. I think I'm doing much better than people in the community that weren't in that building. So I, she's able to talk about it and go through that. And that really struck me that Audrey's take on this was that she not empowered, but she understood what happened and she's able to resolve her trauma, and it's always going to be there for everybody. And so I don't know what you think about that, Barry, about how you feel as you're moving forward in life, even talking about it today. Uh, in my case, Brad, I have to compartmentalize stuff. I have a wife that is suffering from lung cancer, and uh, I am the caregiver. So I have to make sure that I do things for her benefit as well as for my own. I do have a psychiatrist that I talk to occasionally, but I do have these other groups that I talk to, uh, our synagogue group, 
our uh, bridging uh, families bridging kindness group. Um, but the stigma will always be with me. Uh, I don't walk into a building and sit with my back to the door. I can't do that. Uh, I make sure that I'm out of range of the windows. Uh, I react whenever there's a loud sound. Um, I guess about two years ago, before COVID, uh, we were sitting at a, uh, a, a Friday night uh, dinner or a Friday night gathering at the synagogue. Someone dropped a chair and I was under the table. I don't know how I got there, but I was under the table. Um, it's something that you, you live with, you have to compartmentalize with, but you're always aware of your situation. You know, I, I, I don't think I've been to a, a movie theater since, simply because I don't know what's behind me and I don't know where the doorway is and this, that, and the other. I have to give credit though. Our rabbi seemed to know where he was sending us. He sent us to uh, myself and Carol and blessed memory Melwax to a storeroom. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't know where the back entrance to the storeroom was. Uh, so I just sat, I was in, a, in the back of the storeroom. Uh, I had a dumb cell phone and I used it to, to, to call 911. That's neither here nor there. Uh, he had the wherewithal to know where to push us, where to get us. And we had the wherewithal to stay quiet. And I was very, very fortunate in that the cell phone went dark as soon as I started talking, because you know the rest of the story. Yes. Um, it is something that you don't ever want to go through, but it is something that makes you awfully grateful for life, for living, for family, and for friends and community. Uh, I'm, I'm involved with a lot more community members now than I was. I'm a member of the Zone 5 police organization here in, in, in Stanton Heights. I'm a member of the Stanton Heights Neighborhood Association. And of course, with my synagogue, I'm on the board and on the, I, I'm, I'm there to answer questions if, if that comes up. Um, so I have been, become, I've become more involved, but the, the, the situation never leaves me and it never will. And I know mem there are members that have been touched even worse than myself. I know of one that I won't mention. She can't even look at the Tree of Life building. Um, I'm an inveterate uh, photographer. But if I take pictures of the uh, gatherings at the building periodically, like we had a, a group of Jewish uh, motorcycle people that came to the city that I took pictures of about a year or so ago, but I had to make sure that all my pictures were framed away from the building because she can't look at anything that has anything to do with the building. She lost her husband. And, uh, you know, you, 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 you function. And as I've said earlier, it never leaves you. It's always there. Uh, and uh, it probably always will be there. It, and Barry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I do right. so appreciate you sharing that story. And, 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 you know, six weeks prior to the attack on Tree of Life, we were in your area where you worshipped. And that's where we did that last run, hide, fight. And right. we walked through uh, right after there. And I, I knew that back stairwell. And we spent that night uh, clearing out the stairwell and the exits and everything else. And that's another one of the, the takeaways that, that we always talk about when we go to all the shuls and do our training and walk through. So thank you, sir. And thank you. And for yeah, the other thing I have to, I have to mention without our great police force, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. He led the, 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 the officer led myself and, and Carol out of the back of the building and they put themselves between us and the building. The shooting was still going on. The shooter was still in the building. He was still shooting at the officers and he, the, the, the police department set themselves up as a picket fence between us and, and the building. And if the bullets would have come in our direction, they would have hit the cops. So my, my heart goes out to the police officers. My, my feelings for them is tenfold. Um, 
I will never forget them. And I, I constantly say hello to the commander. I always pass on his words and, and the, the, the crime stats. And uh, it's, it's, it's amazing what our, our Pittsburgh police were able to do in a situation <laughs> like that that happened so closely. And as a side note, the gentleman that was in charge of the police officers in, in, in that case was also the commander of the Zone 5, which was our area. But he uh, was familiar with, with the Tree of Life building. He knew where to send the officers. He knew where to send the medics. And it was amazing that, that they were able to get in and, and, and get everything under control as quickly as they did. My heart goes out to them. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. He's, he's a, he's a yes. police chief in another community. But uh, I always communicate with him as much as I can. Very. Brad, we have a question about uh, the medics being sent in and was that contradictory to the run, hide, fight uh, rule? No, it's exactly how we trained it. And in fact, I'm um, actually in, like I said, in Massachusetts, getting ready uh, tomorrow morning to train law enforcement. There's about 200 law enforcement officials here. And what we set up in the city of Pittsburgh was this rescue task force concept where when tactical teams go in that they have medics with them. And so the way Barry was describing this, uh, for almost a year, the Jewish community partnered with the city of Pittsburgh. We opened up our facilities to law enforcement to do training in all our facilities. And we did a large scale exercise in January or yeah, January 25th, 2018, 10 months prior, training on exactly that protocol. And we had 250 people at our JCC down the street, 125 community members participating in this active shooter drill with law enforcement to practice getting people out of harm's way when the shooting occurred. And so that was the first time in the city's history that the rescue task force was deployed. And as Barry was saying, that never happens before in law enforcement. That's a new phenomenon where we're putting tactical EMS and medics. And we actually had a trauma surgeon inside of Tree of Life rendering life-saving first aid to two police officers, one who was shot eight times, the other who was shot two times, and one of our community members who was shot in the arm a couple of times. So that training even before in the Jewish community's willingness to open up all their facilities and to Barry's own words uh, with the commander of zone five, which is a different zone uh, than, than the tree of life, which is zone four. But he knew the facility because a lot of our law enforcement officials knew where every one of our facilities were. We put every police officer through uh, a four hour block at our Holocaust center that started in July of 2017, the city of Pittsburgh agreed that they would send all their police officers to us at the Holocaust Center. And we spent four hours with them talking about the community, talking about cultural sensitivities, also talking about the rise of the Holocaust, but really uh, educating our, our first responders, our law enforcement on the community, where it's at, how they're getting targeted, who's threatening them, what are the hate groups out there. So we had spent a year and a half building a great relationship with law enforcement and that that saved lives that day that that drama surgeon in there saved lives and and to barry's point pittsburgh pd did not hesitate the first police officer that went in the door was shot the second police officer was injured by flying glass they drove the bad guy up to a, an area where the, he was no longer able to shoot right. at, at civilians. Now it's a, it's a battle between law enforcement and the bad guy. And then the rest of the police department were able to go through and get all the people that were secreted in the building out there to safety. So they did a phenomenal job. And, and Barry, I echo that point every single day. And thank yeah. you for recognizing that and noticing oh, that. I will never forget it. I will never forget it. So, um, so what I hear you saying is they drove him out of harm's reach and then the medics go in with law enforcement together in a team? Yes. Yes. Thank you. It's called warm zone extraction. It's relatively new in law enforcement. 
uh, you know, and that, that's a good question for our Sacramento PD. Are they training that way? Are they training on warm zone extractions? And, and, and when we have a security program within our communities that, that, that were there, uh, or that we have an embedded security director, those are things we work with, with, with law enforcement. Because everybody on my team were, were all retired law enforcement. So there's another question about the trial um, and why it's taking so long. I think this is, you know, everybody is really exasperated and really frustrated that this is taking so long. And, you know, Brad, feel free to chime in. But unfortunately, um, <clears throat> The, the, the attorney representing this murderer uh, is, um, they keep getting more time, unfortunately. And now there's a question about taking it out of Pittsburgh out of concern that uh, it might not be a fair trial if it does take place in Pittsburgh. And so there's no question this person did what they did. You know, there are several witnesses, endless evidence. So it is, we are hoping as the film shows at the end that it will start sometime in the summer months, there's, there's a limited amount of information that's you know, able to be shared. Obviously it's, a, it's an active situation case wise, but um, that is, you know, Brad, you feel free yeah. to elaborate. So, so one, I, I typically don't talk about the trial because I've made an agreement with the United States Attorney's Office since it is an active investigation that when he, even I train law enforcement, we don't talk about motives and everything else that happened. We all know why it happened. The problem in this particular case is uh, the United States sought for the death penalty. And so now it's a death penalty case and that just extends that procedure out. And COVID hurt us a lot in, in the delay. And honestly, um, to present and get approval federally for a death penalty case, you know, they spent a lot of time with a lot of the survivors and the victims' families to, to see where they wanted to see this trial to go, whether it's a death penalty or not death penalty case. It, it, folks, it's too slow. It, it's frustrating for everybody. And, and unfortunately, I, I, you know, in my, in my world, I wish he would just plead guilty and go away. We never have to hear from him again. And that would be the best thing for everybody in this community and not to have a trial. But unfortunately, because he is going to be under the death penalty, it, it, it will be a trial unless the United States takes the death penalty off the table. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, thank you for your note. Um, she writes, um, I congratulate you for capturing some big ideas about community, Judaism, the social and political situation. Staying alive is important, but not the only lesson from this tragedy. Elizabeth, share your experience about what other lessons that we should, you know, through, through the film and what you heard everyone share, what do you take away uh, as other lessons? Please. I think it was the fact that this congregation came together, three different denominations of Jews mm -hmm. and how dramatically we are all witnessing that we are primarily not not orthodox and liberal and whatnot, that we are all Jews. And it also shows um, how we respond. I am sure that many of those people there were not um, particularly religious. And yet we are drawn to the main big ideas that Judaism teaches us. And so many, too many to mention, but it, I felt that was so important. And how we come together to, to on force, really, for life, for life, for empathy. The big ideas of Judaism came through in, the, in your, and I, I congratulate you because you could have focused on different things, different aspects, but you brought the big ideas together. I, I don't want to take up too much time, but thank yeah. you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for your beautiful words. I, I didn't do it alone. I have Susan and I have also Eric Schumann, uh, who wasn't able to join us tonight. He's finishing a piece for Frontline, but he was a former Tree of Life congregant and resident of the neighborhood. And it was a mitzvah that we came together in the editing stages of the film. and. Um, 
it was all these, uh, you know, and there's another editor, Lorena Luciano, who helped that, that these are big issues and they come into conversation after one endures this kind of agony and trauma. And I think uh, what we can learn from it is really uh, what is so valuable about the film that everybody, you know, Audrey, who couldn't be here today, talks about, you know, we have to cause peace to happen. It's an active thing that we have to do, that we come reach across the aisle to each other and support each other, you know, um, as Jews, as African Americans, as Muslims, as um, LGBTQ+, all of it, it's like hate has to stop at its, at its onset and having the courage to talk about it and say, hey, that's not okay. Like, let me, let me share something with you. So as artisans, we, we respond in this way that we create a piece so we can have this conversation, but we intend, Susan and I are building a very uh, powerful education campaign around the film that we're gonna take nationwide. We're gonna work with Brad, we're gonna work with all the different uh, folks that are, you know, Deborah Lipstadt and everybody working on how do we reach people to stop this? I mean, it's maddening that we're in 2022 and we're still having this conversation that should have ended. Uh, hundreds of years ago, but you know, nonetheless, we're here and we wanna just be a part of doing everything we can to intervene and stop it. And I just have one, there's another question here. Did the custodian ever come back to work from Andrea? And I wanna tell you that um, he now, he has stayed with Tree of Life, um, Agi, he's so wonderful. And they are in another building now, another temple in Pittsburgh uh, that they very comfortable, very much comfortable with. And uh, he works there every day. He misses Tree of Life, as you know, but he'll come back to it once everything's rebuilt. And he's, he's very committed to his, his extended family at Tree of Life. Um, so um, I think, let's see if there's any, um, it, it, everyone it, should be trained yeah, everyone we, we do have a couple security questions brad so um i know it's not about the film per se so you know with with everyone's permission we'll just like see if we can deal with those one is um i'll just say both of them at the same time so you can kind of blend your answer so one of them is do you recommend that local synagogues invite their police departments into their institutions so that they can become familiar with the physical layout and the other one is, do you recommend trainings be offered to the entire congregation or just to leadership and staff? And how do you strike the balance between <clears throat> conveying the, I mean, building the synagogue as a fortress versus the inviting institutions that we would like to be? So I know we're very limited in time and I'll do this very quickly because one, we should be training every Jew in North America. Every Jew should be trained in this without fail. We've all grown up knowing what to do in fire drills, plain and simple. No questions asked. We know what to do. It's the same thing. Run, hide, fight. We need to train everybody because it's ultimately up to us to save our own lives. Law enforcement does a great job. And so, yes, by the way, I recommend you invite law enforcement in. I recommend that you let them into your facilities as many times as possible. It is paramount that we get first responders inside your facilities before something bad happens. To Barry's point, they knew that building because we let them in and out of that building. And so that is important. Uh, you know, every day there's law enforcement appreciation day. Let them have, let them use your restrooms. L encourage them to do their field notes in your parking lot. Whatever that takes, invite them in. And then lastly, we want to be open and secure and welcome. We want to be open and welcoming at all times. Nobody is wanting to create fortresses. What we want to do is train people on how to react if something bad happens. That's how we're going to save lives. We're not going to save lives by security cameras, uh, bollards, and everything else. Those are just one part of a holistic security program. The true program is how we train our community and how you as an individual reacts no matter your mobility issues, your age, uh, those may come to play one day, but we need to get everybody's mindset right that they're not gonna be a victim, they're not gonna lay on the ground, they're gonna move and they're gonna get to safety, they're gonna shelter in place, they're gonna evacuate, they're gonna get away from the danger, plain and simple. And I think I did that really quick within the time limit. Thank you. Susan, you're good. Sweet. I don't know if we have a minute just to acknowledge Ann Eisenberg's note in the chat 
uh, where she was talking about uh, a yesterday a meeting at the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom and um, how she heard a Jewish woman talk about how moved she was by the gesture of the Muslim community um, and uh, you know she, and I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that but that was um, that was uh, a beautiful note. I really hadn't seen the film when she started to talk about it. I watched it after I got home. I had meant to, and I hadn't had time. It was it was very meaningful. I mean, the, our Muslim sisters who were there were very moved. And I was sorry that a couple of them, when we had in-person viewings, uh, had come with me to the Jewish Film Festival to see some films. And one of them said to me afterwards, I just miss the Jewish Film Festival so much. And how come you're, <laughs> you know, when are you going back to the Crest Theater? Um, but anyway, it was a very moving moment in the film for sure, but it spread. I just wanted you to know that it was taken further into another community kind of way. That's, that's so, so good to hear and so, so heartening. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Susan, I don't understand what it, tell me what your role is. I don't understand the difference in filmmaker and producer. Yes, absolutely. So um, a producer on a film uh, can handle um, a lot of aspects of the production um, Trish is also a producer on the film, um, but uh, you know, looking at everything from bringing on um, the crew, uh, hiring the editor, um, hiring uh, all of the, um, you know, it, they can be involved in bringing on cinematographers. Um, so if you look at it as, as a, you know, sort of like a, a small business, um, a producer is often like the um, chief operating officer or CEO of the business. Um, and then the director, uh, you know, is sort of the, you know, chief creative officer um, in, in business terms. Uh, so, you know, at Trish, as um, both a producer and a director was um, more involved in the producing aspect of the film than many directors are. Um, and, you know, I came on to uh, work side by side with her. Um, we also, uh, you know, as a producer, um, we are involved in the distribution and marketing of the film and, uh, you know, uh, impact campaigns, bringing the film around the world. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. And, and I would just add to that, that, um, you know, Susan came in after probably about a year, maybe a year or so into the making of the film, but there really wasn't a lot of funding. I was raising funds as I went along, seeking donations. I had one company tell me, you know, early on when I sought some distribution support to make it about the perpetrator. And I said, how could I do that? How could I do that? You know, that first, why would I want to give that person a platform? And do you think I want to spend three and a half years of my life focusing on their motivations and why, when we have all these beautiful people who have something really valuable and meaningful to say. So I, I by default had to play the producer role early on because we didn't really have funding in place, you know, it was kind of, I just would want out to people that I knew and trusted because I didn't want to have to be told by a studio to make it about something I didn't want. I didn't feel represented my heart and our hearts. And this is why this approach is so important. It's not, I mean, true crime is something, true crime drama is something that's really marketable right now. Everybody watches these, you know, what happened, what, the, the, all of that. And this is not the appropriate for this story at all under any circumstances, in my opinion. So that's why, and I'm, I'm so thankful to Susan because she's just such a light and helps me do my best work and keeps me in check with all the things that are going on because there's a lot of things. And um, I'm so grateful. She is just such a gift. So I'm glad, Anne, you brought all this up. <laughs> Thank so, you, Trish. Yeah. But I think, Tevin, you wanted to uh, share a few things, uh, I believe. Um, 
around some of the experiences that you, you had in Sacramento at your synagogue, right? Oh, your, your mute is um, on. Yeah, I, I just took it off. Th thank you, Trish. And, and um, thanks again for a, a wonderful <laughs> film that, um, that we, I mean, I can't I quite say we enjoyed, but um, it's, it's, it's an experience worth, worth having. Um, so I, I want to say, you know, just a couple of things. One, um, and, and Matt, Rabbi Matt Freeman put something in the chat, but I want to basically say some more about it. Um, more than 20 years ago, almost 23 years ago, uh, three of our synagogues here in Sacramento were firebombed, um, including the temple that I belong to, Congregation B'nai Israel. We lost our library and classrooms and, and um, part of the sanctuary. Um, and, you know, it, it was a very sad experience, but, um, you know, and the, the two people who eventually, um, you know, convicted of the arson fires um, were not only anti-Semitic, but homophobic. And, you know, wound up killing a gay couple, which is, which is how they, the, the, the arson crime um, came, how, how we learned of it. They also firebombed an abortion clinic. So they were involved in, in many hateful acts here in Sacramento. Two things grew out of it. One, um, shortly after the arson fires, almost 5,000 people gathered downtown Sacramento at our convention center. Uh, people from all, all faiths and, and non I can't even say it, non-denominational. Um, people came from everywhere in solidarity uh, because of those hate crimes. The other thing that came out of it, which is very important, at the California Museum, um, we now have a Unity Center. And the Unity Center talks about discrimination, um, ha has constant changing exhibits and it's well attended by classrooms all over greater, the greater uh, Sacramento and Northern California region. Um, so those are good things that happened out of a very bad uh, event. Um, I would like to say just, I'd like to thank the panel for being here. I really appreciate the discussion today. Um, I wanna mention again, that for anyone who has not seen the film, it's available until midnight tonight. And once you click on it, you have 48 hours to finish watching it. Tomorrow starts week three of our three week film festival. And um, I wanna particularly shout out the three of, three of the 12 films. Um, one is called The Tiger Within, which is the last film made by Ed Asner. And it's a, a wonderful film that also deals with anti-Semitism. Um, and it has a very positive ending, I think. Um, the Invisibles is an amazing film by popular demand has been extended for a second week that talks about um, four, it's a true story, about four people who hid in Berlin in plain sight during World War II. And third is a film called Neighbors, which um, is a phenomenal film also based on a true story. Um, so I encourage people to see these three films. Um, all of them are available on our website, which is sacjewishfilmfest.org. And thank you very much. And let's see if there's anyone else who'd like to say anything before we close. Any, anybody? Willie. Oh, I just wanna say um, again, thank you all for to our guests and our panelists, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Um, Trish and Susan, a marvelous film. And Barry, I forgot to say, we are of course grateful that you are here and you've survived. And I was also very grateful for the story you shared about Passover Seders at your grandparents' house. Um, I love that and it was just very sweet. So thank you all. And if we don't speak with you beforehand, uh, may you stay safe and wishing you and your loved ones a good Pesach as well. Thank and you happy, for including me. Thank you. Thank you. And happy Purim, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Happy Purim. Hag Purim Samea. Hag Purim. <laughs>